The thing is that the entire debate over the real age of the pyramids and the Sphinx could very easily be put to rest once and for all if the Egyptologists really wanted to settle the dispute. They simply need to hire a team of independent and impartial investigators to either prove or disprove the theory once and for all. Why hasn't this been done? And why are they so against anyone doing it? The answer is so blatantly obvious that the question doesn't really need asking. It's because they know their theory is totally wrong. And they know that any real study into the site will prove this and then our whole theory of history will come crashing down. That is why they go to such extraordinary lengths to prevent anyone from conducting tests that they know will prove them wrong. And don't let's forget that it's the theories of Dr. Hayas and Dr. Latter that are being threatened here and it is they who are the ones who virtually control all Egyptologists. Imagine their embarrassment if it could be publicly demonstrated that they were both incorrect in their theories. And not only that but it would seem they are also quite aware of the facts but still continually go to extraordinary lengths to keep the real truth hidden from public view. I think it's high time the world asked them to present me evidence that proves them correct and demonstrate to us how it outweighs the far more abundant evidence that proves them wrong because so far, their theories have never been independently and publicly scrutinized. The good doctors have simply brandished their credentials and their arguments have been taken at face value and simply accepted without the need for them to present any corroborating proof. This type of approach to science is unacceptable and can in no way be construed as serious research. The fact of the matter is that the entire Giza complex is a complete mystery and probably still remains so simply because Egyptologists will not open it up to serious research. The time frame academia has provided for construction of the monuments makes no sense at all. The pyramids were an incredible architectural achievement and yet the quality of all subsequent constructions in the area steadily declined. Don't builders usually improve with experience? Why then does the opposite apply in Egypt? The simple truth is that the site was not built by them. John Anthony actually summed the whole thing up very eloquently in his book Serpent in the Sky. Every aspect of Egyptian knowledge seems to have been complete at the very beginning. The sciences, artistic and architectural techniques and the hieroglyphic system showed virtually no signs of a period of development. Indeed, many of the achievements of the earliest dynasties were never surpassed, or even equaled later on. This astonishing fact is readily admitted by orthodox Egyptologists but the magnitude of the mystery it poses is skillfully understated, while its many implications go unquestioned. How does a civilization spring, full-blown, into being? Look at the 1905 automobile and compare it to a modern one. There is no mistaking the process of development, but in Egypt there are no parallels. Everything is right there at the beginning. The answer to the mystery is of course obvious, but because it is repairing to the prevailing cast of modern thinking, it is seldom seriously considered. Egyptian civilization was not a development but a legacy. Academics like Dr. Latter dispute the age of the pyramids or Sphinx as being circa 10,500 BC because they simply say that man had no civilization at that period of our history and maybe they're right. But what if it was not the civilization of man who constructed them? What if they were actually constructed by those who all the ancient tales tell us they were? What if they were built by the ancient rulers who were thought of as gods? In fact the actual builders and true function of the Great Pyramid may be far more controversial and amazing than anyone could have imagined and this will be discussed later in this book but for now the discussion will turn to how it may well have been done. Stone synthesis according to the ancients Egyptologists have long claimed that no ancient records exist that describe how the pyramids were built yet at around the age of 17, I became aware of another, very curious, steel that is engraved on a stone on the island of Sihel near Elephantine, north of Aswan in Egypt figure 84. For some strange reason this steel, known as the famine steel, has never been deemed worthy of serious research by scholars and is merely considered to be an interesting oddity by the Society of Egyptologists. Yet after even a cursory investigation of the artifact one cannot help but question the unfathomable reasoning behind this conclusion. The famine steel actually describes an ancient method for manufacturing limestone, it names the aggregates needed for the raw material and the plant extracts that are required to then bond the mixture of aggregates together. Could the pyramids have actually been cast instead of built by teams of men maneuvering hewn blocks? Now correct me if I'm wrong, 
but surely the fact that such a steel even exists at all should give scholars a reason to at least examine the methods described in the ancient text to see if there is any validity to them. Indeed, I believe the famine steel needs to be made the subject of some very serious and rigorous research before being so readily dismissed. The simple fact that people of ancient times bothered to write this text down carved in stone so it would last a very long time coupled with the fact that the steel describes such a thing as manufacturing stone should give cause for even the most mentally obtuse to consider. It worthy of some serious investigation. The famine steel was discovered in 1889 by C. Will Bowyer and was subsequently deciphered by various scholars. First Brunch in 1891, then Plady in 1891, Morgan in 1894, Set in 1901 and finally by Barbuet in 1953. The hieroglyphic text was then examined and the previous translations were all compared with each other. Unfortunately the steel is slightly incomplete and somewhat damaged with a section that has been broken off near the top but we can still glean enough information from what does exist to kind of fill in the blanks. One third of the steel deals with the building of monuments involving three of the most renowned characters of ancient Egypt. The pharaoh Zolzer, the scribe Imhotep and the god Knum. The remainder of the steel speaks of various aggregates and plant extracts to be used in the process of manufacturing stone possibly even for the monuments mentioned. The text contained in this unit artifact has almost exclusively been considered to be interesting but fanciful and has been dismissed as a topic of no real use to any serious investigator of Egyptian antiquities. Yet in studying the steel an intriguing question emerges. What would happen if we actually tried it and did what they described? Could the stone of the pyramids have actually been mixed and poured into place at the site using plant extracts and aggregates available in Egypt? And also, would such aggregates and extracts have been available at the location at the time of their construction? The answer to both these questions is very a resounding. Yes, they could have, quite easily. So surely if one can follow the methods described in the famine steel text and in doing, create a mixture that will solidify into a stone of comparable texture and composition to the stone used in the pyramids, then is it not conceivable that it is most likely the method that was used in their construction? Indeed, it is the only really possible way it could have been done. The true answer as to how the monuments were constructed may have suddenly become quite blatantly obvious. Indeed, it would appear that the builders even wrote it down for us. The question is, why is this steel still being ignored by Egyptology? Modern techniques for synthesizing limestone then at last, Someone came to the fore with a radical new theory in the now familiar form of Professor Joseph Davidovitz of the Geopolymer Institute, who also proposed the plant extract theory in the Mayan process and again, all credit must be given to the man. 10 points. Professor Davidovitz wrote a fascinating report in 1998 in which he proposed the idea that the pyramids were indeed constructed using aggregated limestone rather than by manipulating quarried blocks. His theory was then finally published in 1999 in a book entitled The Pyramids An Enigma Solved In the book he put forth the very sound, though academically radical theory that outcrops of relatively soft limestone could simply have been quarried and easily disaggregated with water and then the muddy limestone sludge including the fossil shells mixed with lime and some kind of tecto alumino silicate forming material such as kaolin clay, silt or the Egyptian salt natron which is a basic sodium carbonate. The limestone mud could then easily have been carried up by the bucket full and then poured, packed or rammed into formwork molds made of wood, stone, clay or brick that had been erected on the pyramid sides. The re-agglomerated limestone, thus bonded by basic geochemical reaction into a substance known as geopolymer cement, would then have hardened into resistant limestone blocks as it dried actually solidifying into a substance a great deal harder and stronger than the original starting material. Critics of this theory argue that Davidovitz has never proved that Giza limestone really is geopolymer and of course this is impossible to do because neither he nor anyone else is ever permitted to remove any material for testing and they firmly state that the fact that the limestone blocks Agiza contain intact fossil remains substantially proves that they can not be manufactured stone or geopolymers but are in fact hewn blocks of natural limestone. Interestingly, 
No one specifies exactly why they think that intact fossil shells in the pyramid blocks prove that they are not manufactured blocks as even the most fundamental knowledge of Davidovitz cast stone theory clearly suggests that it was the Giza quarries themselves or else. That provided the limestone rubble for the aggregates of the pyramid blocks. Such intact fossils actually exist in abundance in the limestone of the Giza quarries. Since that time, scientists at the Geopolymer Institute have successfully managed to manufacture and cast re-agglomerated limestone. Because it is of course prohibited to remove any material from the site of the actual pyramid for testing, for the purpose of the test the scientists selected a soft material containing a high percentage of fossilized shells from a quarry in France to ensure the geological material used in. The experiment was very similar to that which is found in the quarries of the Giza Plateau in Egypt. The purpose of the test was to demonstrate that this type of soft limestone material is indeed perfect for re-agglomeration. The scientists then disaggregated the material with water. They then mixed the muddy limestone and its fossil shells with kaolin clay and a basic geopolymeric binder. The limestone mud was then packed into a pyramid-shaped mold. The re-agglomerated limestone they created, bonded by geochemical reaction, then hardened into a resistant geopolymer limestone block figure 85 and 86 that turned out to be a great deal harder than the original starting material exactly as they had predicted it would. It was very notable that the whole process had the effect of strengthening the softer stone thereby making it more resistant to such things as weather pollution, acid rain, temperature variations and all those things that will generally just mess up your metallistic monument. Because the institute was not authorized to sample original materials from the Giza Plateau quarries naturally they were not able to use the exact formula described in the ancient Egyptian text. The French limestone that was used in the test is very similar but unlike the Giza limestone, it had no reactive clay in it and the team was forced to add some. Nevertheless, the final result was extremely close to the constituency of that which is found in Egypt both chemically and geologically. According to Davidovitz, with the Egyptian formula, the result is also slightly different because it requires bigger blocks for a better cohesion and is not particularly suitable for smaller items. However even with the slight change of formula due to differences in the materials, these groundbreaking tests have clearly demonstrated that the process is quite possible and the only real key to the complete success of the procedure is in using the appropriate raw materials to begin with. During a television special filmed in 1991 called This Old Pyramid, Professor Davidovitz had the opportunity to demonstrate his cutting-edge theory and in the process, to also demonstrate the unique property of the Giza limestone that further supports the idea in the presentation a chunk of limestone taken from the nearby Giza quarry was very easily disaggregated in water within 24 hours, leaving the clay and the other constituents gently separated from each other. This demonstration showed that the existing fossils in the limestone would naturally remain intact as it would not have even been necessary to crush the stone during the manufacturing process as unlike other limestone, material from the Giza quarry simply breaks down in water all on its own. As I mentioned before all credit must be given to Professor Joseph Davidovitz of the Geopolymer Institute for his groundbreaking study into this process and I highly recommend reading his work on the subject. This certainly may go a good deal in helping explain how these ancient masses of stone may have been constructed but again we are still left with the question. By whom were they made and for what purpose?